first we're going to start with some motion without resistance. Um, so motion without resistance is one of the specific types of motion that um, is covered in the HSC Mathematics Extension 2 syllabus. Um, it used to be actually something that was in the HSC Extension 1 syllabus, now it's in the Extension 2 syllabus, um, but it's a solid foundation because a lot of the equations that you use for motion, with motion without resistance is also applicable to motion with resistance. So yeah. Now a bit of revision, obviously you would have seen this stuff in potentially year 11 or even earlier. Displacement, um, the, the displacement function is given in terms of x, velocity is v, and it's the time derivative of the position or displacement, and it's sometimes noted as x dot, and dots again are often used, utilized to de uh, demonstrate the time derivative of a function. Now acceleration is the rate of change in velocity, that is how fast you'll get, how fast you're becoming faster, if that makes sense. Um, so it's pretty much, when you think about acceleration, you should think about like sort of the accelerator in a car, you're increasing your velocity. You're going from say zero kilometers per hour to 60, um, 80, 90, 110, whatever, right? So acceleration is getting faster. Velocity is a measure of how fast you're going. Displacement or position is where you are. Um, and acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. Right? And because we know that velocity is a time derivative of position, we can also express acceleration as a second derivative of position with respect to time. And so it's <laughs> denoted as x double dot. Okay, so um, you can, uh, clearly you can see that the expressions for x of t, velocity, v of t, and a of t all clearly define functions of time. Right? That is, they are dependent on time, and you see a t in the formula for them. However, sometimes it's more useful to express acceleration in terms of displacement, x, or in terms of velocity, v, rather than in terms of time. Now, the reason why we heavily emphasize acceleration is because that's sort of our starting point in a lot of questions, and the reason for that is Newton's second law. Um, so Newton's second law, when we analyze the forces on a system, right, we can say, okay, this is the net force, this is the mass of the object, hence the acceleration must be so-and-so. And we can do that in different dimensions, so we can have that a two-dimensional, three-dimensional case. Uh, um, for the HSC, usually you're dealing with two-dimensional cases at, at maximum, um, one-dimensional cases for motion without resistance and resistance motion and simple harmonic motion. Um, projectile motion is the case where you're going to start dealing with two dimensions. But yeah, we'll get we'll get to that in a, in a, in a bit. But um, yeah, so sometimes it's more useful to express it in terms of velocity uh, rather than velocity or position rather than time. Now, if v of x specifies the velocity function of x, then we can use the chain rule of differentiation to calculate acceleration. So we're going to say that dv dt right, is equal to dv dx times dx dt. Now, you might be interested, you might be asking why we're doing that, but it will become obvious in a second. But as to why that's um, true, it's just an application of the chain rule. Now, remember, chain rule sort of looks like a bit like fractions, right? A um, bit like the fractions cancelling each other. Now, that's not exactly the case, but we can sort of pretend it is. So you can sort of think about the dx is cancelling each other, and so we still end up with the same dv on dt expression. Um, so we can say dv on dt is dv on dx times dx on dt. Okay. Um, so dv dt is therefore dv dx times v. Now, the reason we can say that is where have we seen dx dt before? Well, that's just our definition. If you go back to this slide here, that's just our definition of velocity. And therefore, we can say that dv dt equals dv dx times v. We just replace that dx dt for v. Okay, so that is one form of acceleration. So we can say x double dot is our acceleration, or dv dt is equal to now, I usually they just switched around in order, so v, dv, dx, that's, our, that's one of the forms of acceleration. That involves v's and x's. Now, there is another expression that we can come up, which, come up with, which also inc includes v's and x's. You might be interested in like why that's useful, but we'll uh, potentially cover a few examples in which we're going to have to use that expression, um, and that's going to hopefully make it a bit more obvious in terms of why we do this thing. So we get dv dt equals dv dx times d dv half v squared. Now, you might be wondering where that, where that came from, but if you just evaluate this derivative here, 
that's the derivative of v squared on 2. Well, if you use just power rule there, that's just going to be v, right? And so all we're doing is we're replacing that v with a derivative expression equivalent to it. Now, that seems like we're overcomplicating things, but here's where the chain rule comes in again. You see we have a dv here and a dv here. That means that they sort of cancel. Now, again, not exact, exactly cancellation. It's just a, a result of the chain rule, but we can sort of treat it like fractions. And so we can say dv dt equals d by dx of v squared on 2. Now, that's our second form of acceleration. Um, yep, so we have x double dot equals dv dt. Oops, dv dt. Let me just clear that out. So dv dt equals to v dv dx, that's one form. And that's also equivalent to d by dx of v squared on 2. So we have our two forms of acceleration. Now, we have to be careful in terms of picking which form is it applicable to each question. So yeah, these are our different forms of acceleration. We've got dv dt, just the rate of change in velocity. And because the velocity is the rate of change in position, we can express the acceleration as a second derivative of position with respect to time squared, uh, with respect to time, so we get that. And then we had we came up with our v dv dx expression, which is just an application of chain rule, right? And then we came up with this expression here, which involved coming up with an equivalent expression for velocity um, as a derivative, and then applying chain rule. So these are our four forms of acceleration. Now the first one, the uh, third one and the fourth one are the most commonly used like used ones. Now the second one is also used, but that involves say if you start off with an acceleration as a function of time and you have to integrate it twice, then you can end up with a position as a function of time. That's still used, but um, in terms of the HSC, HSC extension two syllabus, the first, the, th the third, and the fourth ones are used the most. Not to say that the second one isn't used, but um, it's just the way most questions like to do it. Okay, jumping into um, picking the right equation. Okay, so given acceleration is a function of, uh, so the forms you use in a particular problem will depend on the form of the equation that defines acceleration. So given that the acceleration is a function of time, we use dv dt, or d squared x, and that should be dt squared, in order to um, come up with a velocity or a position expression. Right. So if we've got time involved, so th that is acceleration is purely a function of time. Um, so like say 3t squared plus 4, um, clearly 3t squared plus 4 is purely a function of time. Hence we can use dv dt or we can use d squared x dt squared. Okay. And so that is going to give us a velocity as a function of time expression or a position as a function of time expression. What if we have an acceleration as a function of position? What if... You know, the further away we are from the origin, the 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 greater the acceleration gets. And we'll come across a very specific example of that in simple harmonic uh, simple harmonic motion. But what if that is the case? What if the acceleration is a function of position only? Um, then in that case, we would use ddx of v squared on two. Now, if acceleration is a function of velocity, which again will come across in motion in resisted motion, right? So, for example, when we're talking about resistance, just a bit of a peek ahead. If we're talking about resi resistance, right, particularly air resistance, the faster you go, the greater the sorry, the greater the um, sort of resistance becomes, right, and therefore the greater the force becomes. And so, in that case, it's actually proportional to the velocity squared. Um, if we're talking about just aerodynamic drag, and so because it's proportional to the velocity squared. Our final force function is most likely proportional to the velocity. And in that case, we use dv dt if the initial conditions are in terms of t and v. So that is, if we say initially the particle is at rest, or if we say something at uh, something along the lines of if the particle, sorry, at t equals 5 seconds, the particle is traveling at 10 meters per second. If we have some initial conditions in terms of t and v, then we use dv dt. Otherwise, if we have in each initial conditions in terms of x and v, sorry, that should be a v, in terms of x and v, then we would use v dv dx. So that is something like, initially, the part, uh, or 
yeah, initially if the particle we say is at the origin, so at x equals zero, v equals zero, so initially the, uh, when the particle is at the origin, it is at rest or something like that, then we would use v dv dx. Otherwise, if it's in terms of t and v, we use dv dt. And it seems a bit theoretical when we say it this way, but hopefully a few examples will clear that up. And yeah, let's start with our first example. Um, this is actually pulled from the extension 1 HSC uh, from 2017, question 12b. Um, if you go to past papers from Maths Extension 1 um, before 2020, you'll see that some of them involve a few of these V, D, V, D, X, D, Y, D, X, V squared on 2, D, V, D, T questions, which um, have now been moved into the Extension 2 syllabus. You might find them sort of easier compared to, you know, the actual HSC Extension 2 type questions, but um, they're still worth practicing because it helps you uh, sort of practice the use of picking the right expression and using the right expression. So yeah, let's do this one. Open up one note. And that should be visible. Okay, so let's start with our expression. We, we're given that t equals to 4 minus e to the minus 2x, right? And we're asked to find the expression for acceleration, that is x double dot. Okay, so we have t and x, right? And what does that mean? We're probably going to have to use dx dt, right, in order to get a velocity from, uh, expression. Because to get from position to acceleration, you either have to differentiate position twice to get acceleration, or you have to get to velocity and then use some of the other forms. So to get the position expression, now we have an option of trying to rearrange this um, and get x equals so-and-so in terms of t, but there turns out to be a more efficient way, and that is to use um, one of the rules for uh, reciprocating derivatives. Again, treating derivatives a bit, a bit like fractions, but again, it's a result of the chain rule. So if we take the derivative of t with respect to x, which is the actual sort of flipped version of velocity, um, we get the derivative of 4 is just 0, derivative of e to the minus, uh, sorry, minus e to the minus 2x, if we bring the negative 2 down, is 2e to the minus 2x, right? And from there, we want the velocity expression, and if we want a velocity expression, that means that we're going to have to use, um, we're going to have to sort of reciprocate both sides. And so what we can do is we can say dx dt, is equal to 1 half e to the power of 2x. Now, because if we reciprocate a negative 2x, it's going to be to the power of positive 2x. Okay, so that gives us a velocity expression. v equals to oops, uh, yep, v equals to 1 half e to the 2x. Okay, now we're at an interesting point. We have a velocity and position relationship. So that means that we're probably not going to have to differentiate with respect to time again because we have no t expressions, right? We could potentially try and um, use v dv dx, but in this case, I think what's better is going to be... Now, either way, I think it should either way work, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to square it, because v squared is 1 quarter e to the power of 4x, and divide that by 2. Now remember, our acceleration form was d by dx of v squared on 2, so we want to try and force it into that form. So we get v squared on 2 equals to 1 eighth e to the power of 2x, sorry, 4x. And then we can take the position derivative. So you get d dx of v squared on 2 equals 2. So if we take the position derivative of that, the 4 comes down. So we get 1 half e to the power of 4x. And remember, d, d dx of v squared on 2, 
that is our acceleration expression. So we can say x double dot, x double dot, which is the second derivative of the position with respect to time, is half e to the power of 4x. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward, um, just using it, using one of those forms. Now at this point, if we use dvdx, then we should pretty much end up with the same expression, right? So if we use dv dx at this point, that's going to be one half, sorry, one half times, so one half divided by two, which is half a quarter, e to the power of two x. And then d dv dx, is dv dx so that should be one half yep so one half times um, where it went wrong. If you take the derivative of e to the 2x, half e to the 2x, that's just e to the 2x, right? And so that's just going to be, if we multiply the two quantities, v dv dx, that's going to be 1 half e to the 4x. So same result, you could go either way, um, really doesn't matter in this case, they're both about the same amount of work. Yeah. But sometimes it, one will be quite obviously a lot more work or a lot less work than the other. So it's a matter of picking and choosing which one's the most appropriate in each case. Okay, moving on to the next question. We have a particle is moving horizontally. Initially, the particle is at the origin, right? O, moving with a velocity of one meters per second. The acceleration is given x double dot equals x minus one, where x is displacement, is its displacement at time t. Now, at that moment, you should stop there and say, okay, we've got acceleration as a function of position, right? And so that means that we're going to have to use potentially v dv dx or d by dx of v squared on 2. Um, but if, if we're eventually going to try and find a position or a velocity expressions, expression um, at some point. And we also have an initial condition. That is, initially the particle is at the origin. That is position with velocity 1 meters per second. So we have a position-velocity relationship um, in terms of an initial condition. Okay, part one says show that the in, show that the velocity of the particle is given by x dot equals one minus x. Okay, so x dot is just our velocity, right? So we want to try and show that that's equal to one minus x if x double dot equals x minus one. So let's do that. So we know that. Let's just get that to x minus one. Yep. So we know that x double dot yeah. so we know that x double dot equals to x minus one. And we're looking for a velocity um, position relationship, right? And so let's use this time d dx of v squared on two. Let's express our acceleration in that form. And the reason we do it in that form is because we have on the right hand side a function that is purely a function of position. And in that case, we can go ahead and integrate with respect to position, right? So we can say v squared on 2. If we integrate the left hand side, it's just going to be v squared on 2, right? v squared on 2 equals to the integral of x minus 1. And so here we're going to end up with the integral of x is just going to be x squared on 2. And the integral of 1 is just going to be x. Now remember, whenever we have an indefinite integral, we're going to end up with a constant, c1. Um, when we integrate the left-hand side, we do theoretically get another constant. But because we're gonna, we have two indefinite integrals on both sides, we can sort of clump them into one constant and leave that on the right hand side. So we end up with the expression v squared on 2 equals to x squared on 2 
minus 2x, sorry. Uh, yep, yeah, minus x, sorry. Plus c1. Okay, and we can go through and multiply through by 2, and we end up with v squared equals x squared minus 2x plus I'm going to leave it as C1. Now, the reason I can do that is because it doesn't really matter what I call it as long as we end up with the right number at the end. Um, so plus, or you can, we can even call it C2, uh, C1 dash, if we'd like. Now, how do we evaluate C1 dash? Because obviously in our final expression, we don't have a C1 or some constant in there. How do we evaluate that? Well, that's where our initial condition comes. We know that when t equals 0, that is initially, x equals 0, and our, position, and our velocity equals 1, because we're told that initially the particle is at the origin, and its velocity is 1 meters per second. So let's go ahead and plug that in. So we get 1 squared on the right, so just 1. Um, yep, 1 equals to um, x squared, so 0 minus 2 times 0, which is 0, c1 dash. So clearly, therefore, we conclude that c1 dash equals 1. What does that mean in terms of the equation? So what does that give us in our final equation? Um, yep, so we get v squared equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. We're not quite there yet, but the reason we're not, uh, but if we go look back at the expression that we're looking for, we're looking for x dot equals 1 minus x. How do we end up with a 1 minus x from this expression here? Well, the way we end up with that is by using a bit of a clever trick, and that is to use some factorization. You have to keep your eye out for potential perfect squares. So in this case, x squared minus 2x plus 1, that's a perfect square, and we can express it as x minus 1 squared. Now that, trying to uh, sort of see that the moment you do these sort of questions is a bit tricky, um, but it just comes with practice. So yeah, you need to be able to look at, you need to be able to sort of look through expressions, see some patterns, um, and see what's a perfect square, what's not, what can you do? to get it into the, the form that we're looking for. Now we can go ahead and square root both sides. And if we square root both sides, we get um, yep, so v equals to plus or minus x minus 1. Now we do definitely need the plus or minus there because we're taking the square root. Um, and this quantity can either be positive or negative, right? x minus 1 can, uh, like, the, the value that we're taking the square root of uh, when it comes out, well, when we square this value, you can take positive or negative form when we square root it. And so if that's the case, we can say we need to look at one additional thing, right? And that is when x, well, additional thing in the sense that we've already looked at it, but we need to use that piece of information in order to figure out what, um, whether it's a plus or uh, in the minus case. And that is, we use the initial condition again. This sort of question is a bit rare in the sense that it's hard to find questions where you're going to have to use the same initial condition twice. But um, clearly it still does exist. So we get v equals to 1 at x equals 0. So we get plus or minus 0 minus 1 equals positive 1. Well, that clearly means we're going to take the negative case. right? So that means if we want 1 coming out of that expression, we're going to take the negative case. So we get v equals to negative x minus 1, or if we sort of redistribute the minus sign, we end up with 1 minus x. And that was the expression we're looking for. So we end up with v or x dot, either way, is equal to 1 minus x. And so we're done with part 1. Part 2 says find an expression for x as a function of t. Okay, so we have a velocity in terms of position. This is a good platform to find position as a function of time. Why? 
because we can express velocity, so v equals 1 minus x, as dx dt. And here's where we do the little reciprocating trick, right? Um, we can go ahead and flip both sides, sort of like fractions, but again, not because they're fractions, but because of uh, a result of the chain rule. We end up with dt dx equals to 1 over 1 minus x. Sorry about that. 1 minus x. And so it, now we can go ahead and integrate both sides with respect to x. And, we so, and so we end up with dt is equal to the integral there. Um, so we end up with integral of dt with respect to x. If we separate where variables is 1 over 1 minus x dx. Now the integral of that is going to be negative ln 1 minus x because if we take the derivative of 1 minus x that's minus 1 and um, negative on the out the front cancels it and so we get the f dash x over f of x and that's clearly an ln plus a constant here because again it's an indefinite integral so I'm going to call that c2 and that's t okay so we're at this stage where we've got t um, x and the c2 we can try and get rid of the c2 and that's again where we rely on the initial condition this time, not in terms of velocity and position, this time in terms of position and time. So we're told that when t equals 0, that is another way of saying that is initially, t equals 0, x equals 0, the particle is at the origin. And so if we sub that in, we end up with 0 equals to minus ln x, sorry, 1 minus 0, which is just 1, plus c2, ln 1, that's 0. And so that concludes that C2 must also be 0. And so our expression for position, sorry, for time is ln, sorry, minus ln 1 minus x. Because the C2 just drops out because it's 0. Once we've gotten that, we're looking for position as a function of time. So we're not there quite yet there yet. We need to, we need to do a bit of rearrangement. So if we do that, we get minus t equals to ln 1 minus x. And we take the, take the exponential of both sides, so we get exponentiate both sides is a better way of saying it. e to the minus t is 1 minus x. And so if we sort of swap the x and the e to the minus t, we end up with x as a function of time is equal to 1 minus e to the minus t. And so we're done. So we've come up with an expression for position as a function of time. x as a function of t is 1 minus e to the minus t. So we're done. Uh, almost done, sorry. Part 3 says find the limiting position of the particle. So because we know that because we know that x equals to 1 minus e to the minus t, to answer part 3, whenever it says limiting something, whether it be position, velocity, acceleration, um, and limiting, sorry, uh, limiting velocity is something that sometimes called terminal velocity, we'll get to that in the resisted motion section, um, but in terms of whenever it says limiting position, that usually means that we're uh, limiting anything. That usually means that we're sending t to infinity. We're looking at what happens eventually, or as time goes to, to infinity. So another way they'll say that is find the eventual position of the particle, or eventually what position does the particle approach. Then in that case, we set t we set t go to infinity, or we take the limit as t goes to infinity, if we want to take it in the sort of stricter mathematical sense. If we take the limit as t goes to infinity, we get e to the power of some really large number effectively, and so e to the power of negative a really large number, and so that approaches 0, and so we end up with x approaching 1. So the limiting position, maybe I'll call it xl, is going to be 1. Okay. Now let's move on. We've got 
a particle starts at the origin with velocity 1, and acceleration given by uh, a equals v squared plus v, and we're asked to find the, uh, where, well, sorry, we're asked to find x, this, uh, expression for x, the displacement of the particle in terms of v. Okay, so we start with, so we start with acceleration, uh, So acceleration equals v squared plus v. And so we start with v dv dx, right? And the reason we know that we need to jump to that is because clearly we have velocities on the right-hand side. But not only that, we've got no positions involved. Otherwise, we could start thinking about using d dx on v squared on 2, right? Um, but here, whenever you use ddx on v squared on 2, that usually means that your next step is to integrate with respect to position. But there's no positions involved at this point. Um, and so we need to do a bit of manipulation first. And so we're going to divide through by the velocity on both sides. So we get dv dx dv dx equals to v plus 1. And we can flip both sides again because of chain rule dx dv equals to 1 on v plus 1 or 1 plus v either way and there from there we can go ahead and integrate so you get x equals the integral of 1 on v plus 1 dv and so that's just a straightforward ln function, right, because if we take the derivative of v plus 1, that's just 1, and that's what we have on top, so we have f dash v over f of v, and so we have ln 1 plus v plus c1, because again, indefinite integral means we have a constant, and so we have a position in terms of v. Okay, our final expression shouldn't involve constants unless, unless they specifically say so, at least for the HSC level. Um, so we have that. How do we evaluate the constant? Well, we need to look back at the question, look for some sort of initial condition or some point along the path or something like that. And clearly at the beginning of the question, they've said a particle starts at the origin, so t equals 0, x equals 0, with velocity 1, right? So t equals 0, x equals 0, v equals 1. We don't have a time in this, so we can use our x equals 0, v equals 1 expression. So when x equals 0 v equals to 1. Substituting that in, we end up with 0 equals to ln 1 plus 1, which is 2, plus c1. Right. And so c1 is just minus ln 2. Easy as that. Okay. And so our expression for position then becomes ln v plus 1 minus ln 2. And there we have it. x as a function of v. And so we're not. For three marks, that's not bad, I would say. Um, we had, what, four lines of working at maximum, or four or five. Not too bad. Three marks, fairly easy marks, I would say. And this one's actually taken from an extension 2 paper. Okay.